find the PowerPoint. And share this. Hello, everyone. I am Blythe Lord. I am the founder and executive director of Courageous Parents Network. It is a real privilege to see to be here in this capacity. Oopsie, don't want this to um, pause. I want oops. Um, the uh, we are. Uh, Oh, I do not want this to autoplay. Hmm, hold on a second, everybody. This is one of those uh, little snafus. Uh, you'd think I'd be better at this now. How can I make this not autoplay? Um, every, hello, hold on. Uh, let's go slideshow. And you'll see uncheck continuous loop. Uncheck continuous loop. Hmm. Is Perfect. it where am I going to see that, Jennifer? Um, use slideshow up in the in your bar that drops down, not in the PowerPoint slideshow. Mm -hmm. And when you click that, does it show unclick continuous loop? No. Okay, go to transitions. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody. This is this is how the sausage gets made. Yeah, um, and maybe go to. Oh, there we go. I've got, I, yo, now I'm all good. Look okay. at that. All right, we are all good. Just found it. Thank you, Jennifer. See, this is where. This is why we. For those of you who are either parenting a child who's seriously ill. A uh, clinician for a child who's seriously ill or supporting this work in some capacity, you know that there are much bigger problems than PowerPoint slideshows. So I trust you forgive me that little bloop, that little bloop. Okay, so um, we are, we ask you to stay muted. Um, you are welcome to put comments in the chat and depending on how much time we have at the end, which we hope there will be a few minutes, we will invite you to take off your mute and just start and you know shout out to some to whoever if if it's Carly or Monica or um, Hannah and you want to say a few words to them you're welcome to just pour it out. Um, we this is a kind and supportive group of people. Um, we are recording this, so hopefully you don't mind that, and we'll be sharing it with people who registered and were not able to attend afterwards. Uh, this is our third annual Courageous Provider Award uh, uh, ceremony, but it is the first we have done on Zoom for obvious reasons. Uh, I appreciate that you are all likely very Zoomed out, so thank you for making the time to join us. Um, that having been said, this hour is not a heavy lift as we are here to honor three very exceptional pediatric clinicians who are being recognized for their extraordinary contributions to the practice of pediatric care, especially palliative care in particular. This is a happy thing. And it's also situated smack in the middle of December, um, approaching as we are the shortest day and the longest period of darkness all year which feels therefore just about right that we are doing something with light and love at the core. While Courageous Parents Network began as by parents for parents, early on it became clear that clinicians were a very important ingredient in this enterprise. If parents are to feel empowered and supported in the face of a devastating diagnosis for their child filled with grief, medical complexity, and pressure to be a good parent, then they need a particular type of care from their child's care team. Thus, while Courageous Parents Network has always promoted the value of pediatric care, pediatric palliative care from its inception, I wanted to go further to actually recognize clinicians who commit themselves day in, day in and day out to this sacred work of accompanying a child who's living with a serious illness and the parents and family members who are caring for this child from diagnosis onwards, including if it comes to pass um, through end of life. 
Like so many other beautiful human beings, these clinicians are typically unsung. I wanted CPN to sing their praises. That's the idea for the Courageous Provider Award. We feel very honored that both medical colleagues and patient families have taken it upon themselves to nominate and give words to, in very personal ways, the positive impact of the clinicians who care for our children. The Courageous Provider Award provides a national stage on which we can celebrate their impact and the power of pediatric palliative care. But it got better than just the national recognition. Because of the loving and generous values and goals of two women, Eileen Beale and Margaret Stewart Lindsay, and the foundations created uh, in their names, and the generosity and goodness of their trustees who steward their legacy so well, we were, we were able to partner with the Eileen Beale Foundation and the Margaret Stewart Lindsay Foundation to make the award even more meaningful for recipients by having a financial component. And I am thrilled to announce right here that this year's recipients will each be receiving for their programs, not for their personal use at home, but for their personal use in their programs, they will each be receiving $25,000 for use at, at their respective institutions. And um, for better and for worse, $25,000, uh, of these programs don't get a lot of money. Um, so hopefully you guys can do a lot with that. Um, so that's very exciting news to share. Um, yeah. And we're very grateful to the Eileen Beale and Margaret Stewart Lindsay Foundation for making that possible. Um, it is important and a great privilege to honor clinicians of this caliber. As I and members of the CPN team who are here tonight and all the families of CPN know firsthand how our child is cared for and how we, as our child's parents and siblings are cared for, makes all the difference in our journey. It is not just about medical interventions, therapies, and treatment. It is about how we are seen, heard, listened to, talked to, and talked with by our child's medical team. Such communication builds trust, and trust in our child's team helps us build trust and confidence in ourselves as decision makers and advocates, advocates for our child all of which is vital is of vital importance to how we as parents and caregivers captain our child's journey. And not just our child who's living with medical complexity, but also our other children, the siblings, if we have them. I am confident that you will come away from this hour together feeling inspired by the heartful goodness and kindness and love that passes between parents and their child's care team during this shared enterprise of caring for a seriously ill child. And now I am delighted to introduce Dr. Bob McCauley, pediatrician, bioethicist, author, and director of the pediatric palliative care program called Bridges at Oregon Health and Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. I also consider Bob a friend and it was in that capacity that he kindly accepted my invitation to say a few words today about what it means to be a pediatric clinician uh, journeying on this journey with uh, family members. So now without further ado, see, look at this. I'm so busy talking, I forgot to advance the slides. Who cares? <laughs> um, all right, without any further ado, here is Bob. Thanks so much, Blythe, and it's a real honor to be with you all on this very joyous day. So I have lost count of the number of times when after having had a heart-wrenching conversation about goals of care or potentially redirecting a child's treatment to focus on comfort, that the parents of that patient have said to me or to a member of our team, you have the hardest job to which on every occasion I've responded by looking them in the eye and saying, I know of one other job that is way, way harder. Because I don't understand what it feels like to lose a child. I have tried to imagine it in order to truly empathize with what parents go through, the parents I'm working with. 
that's probably not the healthiest thing to do as a wise friend of mine who happens to be a psychotherapist observed some years ago when I told him about my habit. Just stop, he said, interrupting me for probably the only time in our friendship, going on to observe that we human beings are not designed to lose our children. We aren't even designed to imagine losing our children, especially on a daily basis and in rare and unexpected ways. However unwise it may have been, it was actually a futile quest anyway, because some things are so incomprehensible and so unfathomably wrong and unjust that they defy imagination. Which is why you should never say to a bereaved parent that I know how you feel. Like seriously, if there's one phrase that should get you immediately disqualified from pediatric palliative care, that's it. But it's not like I or the other members of the pediatric palliative care team that I'm privileged to be a part of don't feel anything. Quite the contrary, we grieve and rage and mourn on practically a daily basis, coming close enough to the fire of sorrow, even if we aren't engulfed by it as parents are, that we are singed and often scarred. And we don't go to great lengths to hide those emotions either because partly we'd fail if we tried and also because hopefully our honest grief might provide some sense of comfort and connection with the parents and the patients we care for. Because even if we can't understand what parents are feeling, we can at least be witnesses to the intense love they bear for their kids. And we can carry the memory of those kids with us of a smile or a favorite activity or words of unexpected wisdom that defy their age and years. Personally, I will always remember what the mother of one of my favorite patients said to me some years after that patient died. She said, my worst fear isn't that he'll die because he already did. Now it's just his dad and me talking about him and my worry will be that it'll be like he never existed, that he never happened. But he did happen. This is me talking now. Like all the other amazing kids, it's been our privilege to care for. And they deserve honor and care and dignity during their lives. And they deserve to be remembered long after their death, which is a big part of palliative care, not just grief support, quote unquote, but grief sharing. Because even though palliative care professionals can never know how parents feel, I think we do know how it feels. It meaning losing someone you love and respect and admire and having a hole in your heart that thankfully will never entirely close. And on my best days, I dare to hope that shared grief is less piercing and shared joy is a source of comfort and community. As you're about to see in the following testimonials, this year's award recipients embody that commitment to patients and families from the time of diagnosis through the myriad ups and downs, sharing hopes and fears in equal measure and not stopping after a patient dies because that child did happen and that parent will always be a parent and our lives as people who work in pediatric palliative care will forever be changed as a result of encountering them both. I am honored to be a part of today's event to celebrate my dear friend, Monica, who it's been my privilege to work alongside the past four years, and Carly and Hannah. You bring honor to the work we are called to do. You bring comfort to the patients and families we serve, and you bring courage and dedication with you each day to, though not the hardest job of all, one that is indeed hard in the sense that it asks everything of you because the stakes can't get any higher. So congratulations on this well-deserved recognition and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Bob, very, very much. You can see why uh, I wanted Bob to say, to, to say something. Um, and yes, Monica works with uh, Bob at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Um, we'll hear from Monica in a moment. Uh, well, Monica is part of the following video featuring our three recipients and their nominating parents. I will now share my screen. 
So my name is Kara Aguilar. I was married almost 21 years when my husband passed away from Huntington's disease. And that same year, my son Marshall was diagnosed with juvenile Huntington's. And I met Monica at Dornbecker's when Marshall had his G-tube um, put in. Marshall didn't do very well recovering from surgery. And that's when Monica peeked in. She was smiley and sparkly like she always is <laughs> and then my son Marshall he passed away August of 2020 and now my son Bodine who will turn 21 next week he is on hospice care and Monica continues to be involved with our family. Mo had symptoms that were challenging to manage. I mean, it took a big team of us here. I felt a lot of responsibility to to preserve who he was, but yet not have him be uncomfortable and, and, you know, in pain. She really helped me define well what I really wanted, you know, for my son. Whenever I would ask questions, she would answer always very straightforward. I never felt like she was trying to mince words or say things in case I couldn't handle it. I always felt very respected. And affirmation also, like, Yes, Kara, I hear what you're saying. That that sounds like a great plan. That sounds like you know what you want for him. Even at the end of his life, it couldn't have been more beautiful. I mean, of course, I didn't want to lose him. And I know a big part of it was my own peace and confidence. I didn't feel panicked about what was happening with him. And I think that really affected the whole family and the, the whole atmosphere in the home. Monica really helps me to get to that place. <laughs> Even though this is a painful experience, there's beauty in that, you know, sending him to God or, 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 or letting go. And so, you know, the fact that we were able to, to work together and have enough peace around those days, those hours, that is huge. I think she just so clearly showed me affirmation and, and validation. We want to make things look pretty. We want to kind of tie things up in a box and put a bow on them. And life is dang hard. How do you like be real, express the joy in the midst of the pain? And I don't know how Kara or the entire family does it, but they do it in a way that is awe-inspiring to me. And I think about it all the time, <laughs> all the time. My name is Cassidy Sicarati. When Billy was born, they told us he had a 25% chance of living. Billy had a lot of airway issues. Struggle, he had trachea malaysia, laryngo malaysia, a chronic lung disease. He had a big bleb when he was in the NICU that completely collapsed his lung. And Billy's last hospital stay was only one week. And decline was very quick, I guess. I mean, one week from admission, you know, and then he died a week later. And I hadn't even packed an overnight bag. So that's like the state of mind that I was in pretty quickly after Dr. Levy came in. You know, at first I remember her just like asking us questions about Billy, like who he was, what he was like. She asked me, and nobody had asked me that there, like how do you best retain information? And to me, that was such a good question. Oh, this doctor is saying call someone. This doctor is hopeful about this. This doctor is using terms like circling the drain. I wasn't internalizing it because I retain information directly. She said, Billy is dying. And nobody had said that to us that way the whole week. I try to find out first from families how they want to receive information. Not easy words to say. And I think, you know, it's helpful to know um, that the family wanted us to be honest and giving them a warning shot, not fluffing it up with 
euphemisms, until we say those words, I don't think families can start making new decisions. One thing she said when we met with her was that we can make decisions and help Billy die with dignity in the way that we thought he would want to. My thinking started to shift about what I hoped for. Every parent wants their child to overcome all odds. Our job is not to squash that hope. Okay, so maybe we don't have control over your child's disease, even though we're going to still try our best. What do we have control over? And sometimes families need to shift their focus and hope for comfort, hope for some time to make some memories, hope for a peaceful death, even though we're going to keep trying our best. And sometimes just thinking about it, I think helps families think through what they do have control over. Our room was filled with maybe like probably 20 people, maybe more people from his school, our family. You know, Child Life came in and got his heartbeat printed out for us. They put his heartbeat into songs. I think it was just a really nice way for Billy to die. Like thinking like, I, I, you know, I hope Billy can like hear everybody right now. And because there was so much love and sadness in the room, but so much love for, for him. And, and we were all able to experience that because Dr. Levy sat down with us and told us Billy was dying and gave us the realization that we could have Billy die on his terms or our terms. So I'm Shonda Salee, and this is Harper Grace Salee. She is almost five. We found out about Harper's diagnosis, which is trisomy 18, also known as Edwards syndrome. And I honestly didn't really want much to do with palliative care in the beginning. It took me a long time to open up to Hannah and to trust her and the team. I remember her being very nice and very caring and open, but to me it sounded like we were going to be forced into giving our child up before she had a chance to live, essentially. If there was one thing that I took away from that first meeting, it was, wow, this is an incredibly strong, incredibly intelligent, well-versed mother and father. Jeremy is amazing. And they knew what they wanted. And it was my job to get them there in the healthcare system. I really wanted her to know that girl, I am here for you. Like I am here and I'm on your side. It definitely took a couple of visits, a couple of weeks for her to actually see that. We have to prove ourselves until I prove that, you know, I am going to stick by you. I am going to fight for you. Why would you believe that I'm going to do anything else for you, but just talk? I'm incredibly grateful that, that she allowed me that space and that time and that we were patient with one another. Five years ago was my hopes and dreams are that my daughter lives long enough after birth that I get to tell her I love her and exactly how she is and I hope to God I get to meet her. Wow, we made it to a year. Only 10% of these kids make it to a year. Here we are looking at five. Right now, uh, my hopes and dreams are that she's happy and I know she is. Not only are we incredibly hopeful because Harper has had such a beautiful, meaningful, wonderful life that has touched so many people. That legacy that she is going to have for forever, like we've taken part in that. And, you know, the reality of Harper's life, unfortunately being shorter than any of us would like, it doesn't ever have to be the focus of our conversation until they want to talk about it. Not every child is going to make it. We know that. Realistically, we know that. But with a little bit of help, there is life. I find that I need to slow down a lot to appreciate time. And Harper Grace helped me with that in her 160 plus days in the hospital as we tried to figure out what she needed and how to get her home. And I carry so many things that Hannah has done for my family. I carry forward. I'll never be able to pay her back for what she's done for my family. So I try to pay forward for what she did. My husband is still active duty. Should the military ever take us away and we knew that Harper's time was coming, I 
would move us back here to make sure that it was Hannah who escorts us on that part of the journey. I would not be willing to walk that part of the journey without Hannah there because I know that at some point when I have to hand my daughter over to Jesus now when my hands are empty for the first time that Hannah will be there to hold my hand and I don't want anyone else in that position So, mm. the, I think what, I hope what you could hear there was three very different instances of what an impact an incredible clinician can have on a family's journey. Um, in the context of traveling that road with a child who's living with medical complexity and significant illness. Um, with Monica and Kara, we hear the impact that listening and validation makes. With Carly and Cassidy, we hear how trust was established in a life-changing way through direct conversation. And in Hannah and Shonda, we see how palliative care first had to, had to break down a pretty big wall of resistance, and then how that relationship and trust built over the years. Now, without any further ado, I will pass the speaker role over to David Vaughn and Brian Potts, who are trustees of the Eileen Bill Charitable Foundation and the Margaret Stewart Lindsay Foundation who are together making this award possible. And just a quick note, I encourage you if you're as you're watching this, if you go into the upper right corner and click view and change your view to make sure your view is set to speaker view so that you can see the speakers as opposed to all the other people in that moment. So I encourage you to please do that. And now, um, Brian and David, if you would please take the floor. And let's get you. Um, Hi, everybody. Um, I think I want to start my very few remarks with, with just a minute of silence uh, to try to transition from those uh, incredible stories we just heard. I, you know, in, in every respect, Brian and I, we're, we are so delighted to be with you and honored to be with you. And we're the two least important people on this call. Um, and I think I can do no better than to, to the crib off of my new best friend, Bob McCauley in a couple of different ways. And, and um, we are, Brian and I, on behalf of Morgan and Eileen, are, are bearing witness to the remarkable uh, work that you all do on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. And I think the thrill for us, again, channeling Eileen and Margaret, is that we get to bear recognition to that witness that you all so fervently deserve. And Margaret, I'll speak for Margaret, Brian, I'll speak for Eileen. M Margaret knew something about loss. She lost her dad to suicide as a teenager. And as a result, one of the ways that she embraced life and, and she embraced life uh, was to have a, an expansive uh, definition of family. So she would gather people and flamboyant people, the, 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 the crazier the better in her home and on the street and she loved to surround herself with good people doing good things. And she was a good person herself. She, she read um, to the blind. Um, I believe she read to law students who were blind, blind and, and studying to become lawyers. We'll forgive her for reading to lawyers, future <laughs> lawyers. <laughs> None of us are perfect. <laughs> so I think... Again, channeling her, uh, the, the word that I jotted down when you all started was sisters. 
I think she would include you all in her uh, definition of, of sisters. And um, I think that there's, there's no greater honor for us than to be able to connect her legacy and her life with, with your lives and the work that you do every day. Um, in closing, I'll say that uh, I, I was struck by that story about Billy and his heartbeat and how it was turned into music. Mm -hmm. And I think that you all turn palliative care and grief into song. And, and Margaret was a music lover too. And so you all are, are connected in, in very profound ways. And we are um, thrilled to be able to uh, deepen that connection and to broaden this family today and, and into the future. Can I just say what he said? <laughs> Because that, that was perfect, and I, I'm not going to add too much more. But I will take you back, Blythe, when you came to us three, three and a half years ago with this idea. And it sounded pretty well, pretty interesting. Dave and I looked at each other and said, yeah, that sounds interesting. Well, yeah, we'll, go, we'll give it a, a shot. And the first recipient was Pat O'Malley, who's here. Uh, and it's great to see Pat. Um, and that was phenomenal for all the reasons that this event today is phenomenal. And then we went down to Miami and we met Kim. And one of the things that, that I love is, is this continuing family, as uh, Dave says, and it includes everybody. And I, I can tell you for sure that if Eileen were here, she would be one so proud, she would be thrilled uh, to include you all in, uh, in her family. And she would also support the recognition that, go, that so many times doesn't, um, is not uh, awarded to you all for the work that you do. Um, and so anyway, Blythe, uh, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that this, this event and these awards are uh, home runs in, in every way. Um, and we're, Eileen and Margaret are so grateful to you uh, to come up with this idea. And we're so grateful, would be so grateful uh, for, for Carly, for uh, Hannah and for Monica for the work that you do. And for frankly, others as well who are doing work and uh, are not being recognized. Uh, I, I think we'd love to, recognize you, but also in recognizing you, acknowledge all the other folks who are doing your work. Um, is there anything else I should say? Uh, I think that's probably enough. And are we giving the awards out now, Blythe? Is that? You're symbolically giving the certificates to each of the recipients. Okay, well, one, one thing I meant to say and forgot because that video was so powerful was that uh, my, my guess is that we all wish we all wish we could be together to do this. Uh, and I, I think Margaret and Eileen, you know, I wish they could be here as well. Uh, they are in spirit. Mm -hmm. So shall we may award these, cer these certificates? Yes. yes. In, in no particular order, I happen to have Carly's right here. And we've worked um, some magic here with the technical people with Courageous Parents Network, where I'm gonna hold the certificate and through the magic of virtual reality, I'm going to zip it, Carly, and I hope you're ready to receive it because here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <Look at> that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, uh, Wanna do uh, Monica's? Uh, Monica, are you ready to receive yours? <laughs> I don't see Monica. Yeah, she's right here. Oh, there she is. Monica, um, I know these words are used all the time, but believe me when I say it is my distinct honor to virtually pass you this award. <laughs> God, it's great when technology works, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, uh, Hannah, last but certainly not least, um, congratulations. Uh, and it's also a great honor um, to present this certificate and this award to you. Uh, 
I'm I'm gonna go this way. I think I'll get out Just of the way. way. Yeah, here, here we go. <laughs> Where's Hannah? I don't see Hannah. Here on this thing. Hannah is um, she's in the room with all those people. Oh great! Her, her colleagues. Oh have great! Gathered hey everybody. And we're gonna get a closer view of her in a minute when she says some things. Uh, well okay, done, great. Brian and David. Well, again, congratulations to you all. Yeah, thank you. Um, really, um, I, I just wanna reiterate that while the recognition would be coming anyway from Courageous Parents Network, the fact that Brian and David and their other trustees um, recognized what we were doing and wanted to recognize these exceptional people year after year and bring with it a financial award that can help these programs that are typically significantly underfunded do more is really incredible. And David and Brian, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, we are going to now get to hear from each of our recipients. Um, we're gonna start with you, Monica, if you would uh, say, share with, let us hear from you in addition to what we already got to hear when you were talking to Kara. And again, everybody, if you're not on gallery view, I do encourage you to, I mean, speaker view, to go to speaker view so you can see Monica in her full screen glory. Thank you, Blythe. Um, I feel like I have to take a deep breath. I think I've been holding my breath for the last however many 40 minutes or so, I guess. Um, and first of all, I just want to congratulate Carly and Hannah um, as well on, on having their work recognized. I loved watching the videos and hearing from the families and hearing from you about the work that you do. Um, those of us in pediatric palliative care are a small community. And I feel like even though uh, there's miles between us, we, we are very close. So I really do appreciate that. Um, Otherwise, you know, so much is the story's told in what you guys have seen thus far. So I was trying to think of what I could say that would be meaningful um, in addition to that. And I'm not sure what that is. Um, what I did think about, though, was there are a couple things that I think are very unique to this day and to this time that we have here together. And so I thought I would just share those those thoughts with you. Um, and one is, you know, just this opportunity to have, as I mentioned, like minded people together to sort of shed the light on the importance of pediatric palliative care. And what makes this really unique is, you know, all of us have our families, um, our kids, our friends joining us today. And although my family, friends patiently, patiently um, listen to me, not necessarily maybe tell the stories, but are so sensitive as to sort of what's going on in that aspect of my life. I'm, I'm so excited that they actually get to see this today. And so even though um, in some respects, it was disappointing to get to have to do this virtually, um, my family in Montana and my kids in San Francisco and, and wouldn't be able to be here otherwise. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, and also, I just you know, I really appreciated hearing, um, and I've done a little bit more reading about um, Margaret Lindsay and her life. And in looking sort of, you know, for common threads, I, um, David had mentioned earlier that she lost her father um, early in her life in a very tragic, tragic way. And, you know, she turned that um, pain into empathy and into insight. And then not only did she do that, she took action um, as far as figuring out a way that she could capitalize, capitalize upon a, a difficult experience in her life and, and help others. And that's something that I really see in our families. You know, that's the amazing thing about this work is seeing um, families take an unimaginable event and move forward with it and develop this incredible capacity. Um, and I, I, it's very much a privilege. I, you know, in working with Kara, with Bo, Mo, the entire family, I, as I said in the video, I'm in awe of, of how they, how they manage the day so gracefully and beautifully and really with such joy, as I said. Um, the other thing that I, I, and of course, I want to thank Courageous Parents Network and, and Blythe because, you know, that's where it all starts and, and you're amazing. And it's an amazing organization that I use as a resource for families all the time. Um, the other thing, and I'll 
I'll be brief and wrap it up here, is just it gives me, it gives us an opportunity, I think the second thing, to, to reflect a little bit on why and how we're here. And truly, when I think about that in my life, this is an award, not for me, it's an award for my team, it's an award for my family, it's an award for my friends, um, all people who um, just are, you know, refill your refill your well when it's low and um, who are just there and, and dive in and do this work together. My team is amazing. Um, both, there's incredible mentorship. Um, they laugh, we laugh, we are, you know, candid with one another. We share difficult times um, and there's just incredible mentorship, both in the team members now and the team members that uh, were on the Bridges team in, in the past. So um, anyway, I, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Um, again, I really, really am appreciative of, of my family being on. Um, my mom's a nurse and um, I think that those vibes carry through um, and I just am grateful to all of you for being here and, and grateful to Kara and Mo and Bo for sharing their lives with me. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, Carly, with your, with your family next to you, which is a beautiful thing to behold. Um, it's really good to see you and, and we'd love to hear you say whatever you feel like sharing. Well, first, hi everyone. I just, I promise to keep it brief. I just wanted to first thank everybody for taking the time to nominate, not just me, but Monica and Hannah. Um, and for this ceremony, I think the fact that this award even exists elevates the work we do. Um, as it was said earlier, I think, you know, often it's a, a, a world that's under-recognized or misunderstood. So just having this award elevates the importance of this work. Um, I had a very brief but meaningful encounter with Cassidy and Bill Sukarati on the same day that their beautiful boy, Billy, died. And they reminded me that we can make an important impact even when the encounter is brief, even on the worst day of someone's life. So although it's hard and although it's underappreciated, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be invited in and to be helpful in caring for patients and families, especially when everyone else feels like they're throwing in the towel um, or throwing their hands up and they don't know what to do. Um, sometimes our team quietly celebrates the moments um, that we know we, when we know we're helpful, um, either to a provider or a patient or a family. Um, or other times we just take care of ourselves, like our chaplain, who's incredibly generous and always makes sure our office suite is full of seltzer and chocolate. So just taking care of ourselves is enough. But this award is a reminder to all of us that we do good work and it's appreciated. And this just refuels me to keep learning and growing as a physician, but also to keep teaching others to do the same. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. It is, um, you know, you and Monica have uh, struck a very, made a very important point, which is that you, while you do exceptional work as the individuals that you are, you don't do it all by yourselves. You are part of interdisciplinary teams. You are surrounded by other clinicians who make a huge difference. And I think it's just a good reminder that we are all, for those of us who choose to be there, what a difference we can make with each other and for each other. Um, all right, Hannah, um, I am hoping you can come to the screen. Oh, there you are. All right, I'm going to, there you are. Hello. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Make sure you can I mean, I had to write everything down. I'm a crier and how I do this work and I'm a crier. It's <laughs> a great question. Um, I so appreciate the time. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, Eileen Beal once shared, I was raised to believe I could do anything. I'm humbled to be able to share that I too was raised to believe I could do anything. My love of lists, labeling, color coding, led me to the intensive care unit where I fell in love with nursing. 
a love that led me to a passion for caring for children and their families on their best and worst days, as well as the roller coaster of emotions in between. I've been privileged to share in the laughter, the dreams, the tears, and ultimately the hope of so many families. I'm often asked why and how I work in palliative care. I show up every day, not only for myself, but for those who find it difficult to show up themselves. I show up to provide a sounding board or a light in the dark. I show up to navigate the unknowns and to provide hope for the good that may come and to prepare for the potential challenges ahead when the path is uncertain. I'm passionate about the relationships I build through this work. I find great joy in baby footprints embossed onto a tiny geode stone or a canvas with a family's handprints. I appreciate a well-laid plan and seamlessly working behind the scenes. Most notably though, it is very humbling to meet a family where they are in a journey that is known to very few, but has the power to touch so many. There are no words profound enough to express my gratitude for the time I've been gifted to spend learning the intricacies of the families and children I care for. The time spent developing trusting relationships has brought immense personal growth, reflection, and certainly humility. I've learned to embrace the moment, even if that moment is spent in silence, that consistency and follow through build trust, and that it is important to be honest and vulnerable in both the mundane and difficult times. Van Gogh shared with us centuries ago, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Just as life is not walked through in isolation, my small things are accomplished with a remarkable, supportive team, both in the hospital and at home. My mentors, colleagues, friends, and family continue to challenge and inspire me. Two characteristics that I have repeated, repeatedly read Eileen herself did for so many. I'm honored to share in the legacy of such an inspiring, strong-willed, and motivated woman. Though I wish I could have met her, I hope that one day I'm able to leave a similar impact. Thank you to the Salise, Dr. Conrad Williams, and the Foundation for sharing a piece of her legacy with me. Hannah, is, um, are the Salise there in the room with you? Pardon me? Are the Salise there? Yes, Shonda's here. Oh, Shonda. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm so glad. Hi, I'm happy to see your face. <laughs> I, hope, I hope Harper's Harper Grace is having a good day, getting excited for Christmas. He is in all of her crazy Christmas outfit glory. <laughs> Shonda actually, um, I was able to attend her nursing pinning yesterday. So she officially graduated from nursing school. <laughs> Oh, that, see, that's part of this too. These children change us in so many ways, including sending parents to school to be yeah. nurses, which we need many more of. Um, thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Carly. Uh, you are inspirations, and I've just, okay, so now, including, um, before we close, we get to hear, um, we've invited Dr. Pat O'Malley, who was the first recipient of the Eileen Beal Courageous Provider Award, and, and Kim Juanico, a nurse practitioner. Um, Pat's at, in Boston, and Kim is in Miami. We've invited them to just say a few words. Um, not sure how many years we can do this as we collect these amazing people, but certainly this year, we wanted to hear from Pat and Kim. So if you, uh, Pat and Kim would just say a few words, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having us. Really, what an amazing crew. Um, dear Hannah, Carly and Monica, congratulations on your recognition as the 2021 recipients of this year's Courageous Provider Awards from the Courageous Parents Network community family during our time as Eileen Beal awardees, Kim and I have had many occasions to be grateful to the spirit of courage and vision and generosity that is honored by remembering Eileen and Margaret in this fashion. And we predict that you too will experience inspiration from their example. 
You have each demonstrated in abundance the willingness to reach out and help those with limited resources. You have the courage to love a child when loss is in the cards, to show up them when there is little other than your presence that you can offer, the courage to name the unnameable and to be, to be a beacon to your colleagues as well as your families. You have the night vision to be able to see in the dark and light a family to the path of a full life no matter how short for their child. And you all have the generosity of spirit to give your all in these most difficult of circumstances. The legacy both Eileen and Margaret leave through your work will challenge and inspire our colleagues in healthcare to treat the entire mind, body, and spirit, not just of our patients, but of their families and caregivers as well. We welcome you to the Courageous Parents Network family, and we're all now charged with doing honor to Eileen and Margaret's legacy and memory. We're proud and glad to have partnered with you in that effort. Congratulations. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, Kim. So I just want to say that um, it's gotten dark here in Boston, where our national headquarters is. Um, Courageous Parents Network, for those of you who don't know as much about us, we are a team of our, our staff is eight people. I do not do this alone. You have heard my name, but I am Courageous Parents Network because there are eight of us um, and they don't typically always get the recognition that they're due and we couldn't do this without them. Um, some of us, some of them, um, in particular, Carrie and Jennifer are uh, also bereaved parents who know firsthand the value of pediatric palliative care. There's also Janet Duncan, who's a pediatric, uh, a, a retired, but not really pediatric palliative care nurse. And then some extraordinary others who have the courage to do this work without having had the personal experience. Carol and Claire and Zach and Billy and um, Lene and Dee, people who don't have, who haven't been through it, but who see the heart in it and have given of themselves so generously. So it is really a group of us. And then of course we are the people we meet along the way, which is the network the other parents, the siblings and the clinicians who be have become the network. There is a snowball effect. So we are only as good as the people who contribute, who advise, who give both directly through their blog posts and the videos and the podcasts, but also those who give behind the scenes as advisors. And then last but not least, we could not do this without the generosity of our incredible um, donors. CPN is entirely, um, is a nonprofit and we are funded entirely by uh, philanthropic dollars, uh, foundation dollars, individual do dollars. And um, we do, some, do have some corporate sponsorship for uh, some patient um, advocacy work that CPN does. So our donors are of extraordinary importance because as one of CPN's first trustee, uh, trustees told me, no money, no mission, which I did not like hearing because I was all about the mission. <laughs> I do not worry about the money. Um, if any of you, I won't say if, if, well, we would be honored and delighted and terribly grateful if um, some of you would like to contribute to this work. It is true that the um, Eileen, Bill, and Margaret Stewart Lindsay Foundation fund the award, and they fund it, as you can see, extremely generously. Um, but the rest of the work that we do throughout the year is funded by other sources of dollars. And um, we would be grateful if you would like to make a gift. I, I will share my screen very briefly, which it will, because on it we'll have. Um, a where the screen where you can see the how you can give um, uh, 
We would also love it if you would join Courageous Parents Network so we can be in touch with you. And if you would follow us on Facebook and Instagram, because we are only as good as the people who contribute and pay attention and advise. All right. Um, I want to thank you all for your time. Look at this. I promised you that it would be under an hour, and it is. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time, for your remarks, and most especially thank you to Carly, Monica, Hannah, and all of your colleagues who show up, and Bob, who show up every day and make such a difference for families. We could not do this without you. Um, okay, so. Uh, Feel free to go, but if some of you want to unmute yourselves and say some words to our guests, we just chatter away and the mayhem can continue and then I'll turn it off. <laughs> Don't have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn, nice. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, if you're all going to be shy, I'm going to end the meeting. Go. I, can I just say one thing? Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I said, nice. Carly's mom, um, I only bear witness to what she's like after at the end of her day and knowing how she has to decompress. And this is a rare opportunity for me to get a window into what she gives of herself all day long, every day. It's still beyond my comprehension. I just congratulate all of you for the outstanding job that you do. And so proud of all of you. And Carly, I love you. You are amazing. Yeah. Any other family? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Oh, very wonderful people. Thank you. Goodbye. Take care and happy holidays. Yes.